officer is still speaking at this moment. It is among the most graphic and moving testimony ever broadcast into American homes. Many hope it will prove a turning point on the issue of date rape. The prosecution is hoping it will be a turning point in its case. Bill Neely, News at 10, Palm Beach, Florida. Here, a 102-year-old blind woman has had her savings stolen in a robbery at her home near South End. Mrs. Violet Taylor had been keeping the money, a thousand pounds in five pound notes, for her funeral. She heard the men break into her house where she lives alone. As they crept round her room, they told her they were police, then wrenched her bag with all her money in it out of her hands. Mr. Major rejected the suggestion from the Dutch that Britain would have to pay for getting the word federal dropped from the EC Treaty being put to the Maastricht summit next week. The Prime Minister in Dublin today with the Irish Premier, Mr. Hockey, said he didn't accept there'd have to be what he called horse trading. Issues had to be settled by agreement, and Britain had already given a great deal in the discussions. Britain, it was clear today, does not always say no to Europe. Witness the curious sight of the live bat pressed into service at the Foreign Office as ambassadors met to sign an agreement British-inspired to protect its like throughout Europe. Signing anything at Maastricht, however, scheduled for next Tuesday, is still far from certain. Last night, for example, the Dutch Foreign Minister made it clear that dropping the term federal vocation from the treaty preamble, or chapeau, carried a price tag. It is not out of the chapeau, and that means that a price has to be paid. In Dublin today, though, the Prime Minister was equally forthright. Federalism had never been on the horse trading table. So I think the suggestion that because on a particular issue there has been movement, that there needs to be reciprocal uh, horse trading of that uh, uh, rather blunt kind is not something I accept. Having faced down Mr. Van den Broek during his visit to Dublin, which he said went well, Very good, Major. Thank you. Mr. Major returned to London to hear of another challenge from one of his own backbenchers. Among the MPs presenting private bills today, Tory MP Richard Shepherd, Voting on his bill for a referendum on any single currency deal, will he says legitimately smoke out the support for it or lack of it. You remember, we're not talking about the nooks and crannies of our national life. We're talking about the very structure and fabric of what our government and forms of institutions are. A referendum, though, would come a long way after Maastricht. But today, the Prime Minister was continuing his pre-summit balancing act. No horse trading, he says, but at the very least, the fact that he and the Dutch are both talking about give and take shows that he knows that some wheeler dealing has got to be done next week. Michael Brunson, News at 10, Westminster. The boyfriend of the murdered Oxford student, Rachel McLean, described how he killed her, but said he could not grasp what he'd done until he was arrested for it. John Tanner said he'd hidden Rachel's body under the floorboards in her flat to convince himself she wasn't dead. He denies murder. Today, Tanner told the jury that up until the fateful weekend when he killed Rachel McLean, he'd had no doubts about her feelings for him. Rachel was found strangled underneath the floorboards of her student lodgings two and a half weeks after Tanner killed her. In court, he said the weekend of 13th April began normally, but on the Sunday evening, she told him she'd slept with a few other men and did not want to get engaged. He said he called her a tart and she tried to hit him. Tanner told the court he had no recollection of killing her. He remembered lunging at her, his hands moving towards her neck. The next thing he remembered, she was lying face up on the floor dead. I felt fear, terror, and an unwillingness to accept what had happened, he said. Tanner then told the court he'd hidden the body to convince himself that nothing had happened. Speaking in a quiet, emotional voice, Tanner said he may have strangled Rachel with a tea towel. He told the court he spent the night on the floor with her body lying just feet away. He said he dissuaded himself of reality. The judge, Mr. Justice Kennedy, asked Tanner to clear up a contradiction over Rachel's last words. Did she say she'd slept with a few men, or that she'd deviated twice from their relationship? Is it not something that sticks in your memory, the last words of this girl, he asked. Tanner replied, no, not necessarily. Summing up in the case has begun and should be completed tomorrow. Eric McInnes, News at 10. Birmingham Crown Court. Now, soccer. Tonight, Rumbelow's League Cup games are on ITV in some regions after the news. Scores in the B&Q Scottish League Premier Division, Aberdeen 2, Rangers 3, Celtic 0, Hibernian 0, Hearts at the top 1, Falkirk 1, St Johnston 1, Airdrie 0, St Mirren 0, Dunfermline 0. 
Division 1, Hamilton 3, Meadowbank 1. The headlines again. The Serious Fraud Office has been called in to investigate the pension fund at Mirror Group newspapers, where more than half the money has apparently been diverted into private companies built up by the late Robert Maxwell. And the last American hostage, Terry Anderson, is now free after nearly seven years. Asked how he felt about being the longest held captive, he said, it's an honor I'd gladly have given up. He's now been reunited with his wife and the six-year-old daughter born after he was kidnapped, who he's never met. And that's the news at 10. From Nicholas and from me, good night. This week has seen renewed calls for the resignation of the Home Secretary, Kenneth Baker. He's the first minister ever to have been found guilty of contempt of court. He's also accused of concealing a special branch operation in Brixton Prison that may be linked with the escape of IRA suspects. His political career has been controversial, but nothing ever sticks. Could it now? Is Baker still the Tories' Teflon man? This week, 8.30 tomorrow on ITV. Stay with us now for our late Northern Life, all the regional news and update after the break in a matter of moments from now. Farlands bring you some of the top names in TV, video and hi-fi, plus interest-free credit. Admire the choice and take the credit at Farlands, Dunn Street and Newgate Street, Newcastle. Accurist gives you just a little more time. This is your moment to be beautiful. Beautiful. The fragrance from Estee Lauder. Available at Bins and House of Fraser Metro Center. Your creations come to life with the Technic Control Center. New Kellogg's Golden Oatmeal Crisp. Sliced almonds, juicy raisins, and light golden flakes that's so delicious, you'd hardly believe it's made with oats. Oats? <laughs> You're kidding. I can't see them. <laughs> no. What the old bike? They're taking the mickey. New Kellogg's Golden Oatmeal Crisp. It's too good to be true. to your eye this Christmas. Look out for our gold star savings on perfect gifts throughout the store. Looks like it'll be a cracking Pictionary game tonight. The rematch. Yeah, well, it had better be after last night's fiasco. Just because you lost. I didn't lose. I just ran out of time. Anyway, your drawing was abysmal. That crocodile looks like a carnivorous carrot. Yeah, but they guessed it. Yeah, and they lost it. Honeymoon. Yeah, it's got that one, too. Is this sour grapes because they thought your killer whale was a trout? And that's for your belly dancer. I didn't know you weren't allowed to mine. Pictionary. The most fun you can have with a pencil. The St. Hilda's Alzheimer's Centre in Darlington provides day care for people suffering from dementia. Volunteers work along with professionals to provide a friendly, stimulating environment for those who attend. If you're free any weekday to help out in the centre with activities or day trips, please contact us at St. Hilda's Alzheimer's Centre, St. Hilda's Hall, Parkgate, Darlington. Our telephone number is Darlington. 284139. Hello there. We're now running approximately five minutes later than advertised, which means that fight night is now coming in in ten minutes' time at 
the latest time of 10.45. It's World Championship Boxing tonight, and the main bout is for the featherweight title between Manuel Medina of Mexico and Tom Johnson of America. Gary Newborn is ringside. That's in 10 minutes' time. Right now, look at the weather forecast. Good evening. Well, the weather's very much in a rut at the moment. We've been enveloped by a rather thick layer of cloud over the past four or five days or so, and this in turn has led to air pollutants becoming trapped underneath all that cloud. In fact, yesterday, while Staffordshire and Derbyshire fared particularly badly, and today it was South Yorkshire's turn, so it's very much been a case of poor air quality in these particular areas. The high pressures to blame sitting fair and square over the British Isles there, with all the real weather action circulating around Britain. Now, further afield over Europe, it's a case of cold air blasting all the way down from the Arctic and leading to some pretty cold temperatures come the weekends. Nothing that dramatic over here, I'm glad to say. Although tomorrow, in keeping with the rest of the week, the day gets off to another grey and grisly start, and any progress weather-wise will be a very slow and rather subtle one. There will be some cloud and drizzle effect in the eastern fringe of the country, and during the day, this will sink southward, affecting East Anglia and perhaps some parts of the south coast. As far as temperatures go tomorrow, it's a case of a more even keel, around about the 6-7 mark for most of us. A touch up on that in the faintly brighter spots like the southwest, but a touch chilly along the south coast with an easterly wind. Good night. words in Cleveland about more cash for schools and Sunderland bid a million pounds to play their way out of trouble. Good evening. The Education Secretary Kenneth Clark has clashed with Cleveland County Council after announcing a major new cash package for Britain's schools while visiting the region. He says the multi-million pound initiative will improve the teaching of technology in the schools selected to receive the cash but critics say that all schools should benefit from it. Mr. Clark flew into Teesside this morning and landed right in the middle of a storm. He chose the much-criticised Macmillan City Technology College to announce details of a £25 million package next year to encourage British schools to improve their teaching of technology. But not all will cash in. They'll have to bid for the money. The winners, expected to be around 100 in all, being chosen by the Department of Education and Science. And that's what's sticking in the craw of Cleveland County Council. I would say it is a lottery, and... Uh... It's not sound grapes at all. I mean, what the government tend to do is they say there's extra money available, then they say how that money will be spent. What we would like to do as local representatives is get the money and then we can decide how it should be spent. I think getting schools who now manage themselves increasingly to decide what they particularly want to concentrate on, what their strong departments are, what kind of choice they want to offer to local parents if uh, they contemplate children going to the school, that is the way we're going to get it. The County Council have been criticising the government-funded Macmillan College ever since it was founded two and a half years ago. They maintain the cash spent on setting up the independent city technology colleges should have been given to local authorities to run existing schools. He's the Secretary of State for Education. 99.5% of all children in Cleveland attend LEA schools. I think he could have found the time to have attended one of our schools. We did invite him to come here today to see what was going on. As far as I was concerned, I was coming to Macmillan CTC. I was always coming to Macmillan CTC. I look forward to visiting other schools in the county, uh, but I haven't got time today. And I say it's just a pity that some of your local Labour politicians seem to have so politicised education, they have a hang-up about what type of state school you should go to. There are reports that British Steel is planning to shed 500 jobs at its Teesside plants on top of the 512 voluntary redundancies already agreed with the unions this year. The company denies that any specific numbers have been identified, but admits that it's exploring further job reductions because of the recession. British Steel's recent half-yearly figures showed profits had dropped from 309 million to just 19 million pounds. The latest jobs shock follows this week's claim that a new 400 million pound plate mill due to be built on Teesside has been mothballed because of the poor state of the world market for steel. The number of people having to wait more than two years for hospital treatment in the region has been nearly halved. 
The Northern Regional Health Authority says there's also been a 15% drop in the number of patients waiting more than a year. Health authorities have been told that by next March they must treat all patients who've been waiting for more than two years. One of the region's water companies has announced a half-yearly profit increase at twice the rate of inflation. Yorkshire Water made £64.1 million before tax. That's an increase of 11.7% on last year. An army captain from Cleveland has been jailed for two and a half years and dismissed from the parachute regiment for stealing more than £40,000 from funds. The court-martial at Catterick heard how Captain Peter Hodgkinson took the money while serving with the territorial divisions of the Red Berets. 53-year-old Hodgkinson from Limpton Gate in Yarm admitted two charges of theft and three of false accounting. The court heard he had an otherwise unblemished and distinguished army career, having served in Cyprus, Bahrain and Northern Ireland and being mentioned in dispatches. Fire brigade chiefs here in the region are warning that people all over Europe are in danger of being killed by fire in their homes because of a decision made by the European Commission in Brussels. Dangerous polyurethane foam is banned from use in furniture here in Britain, and experts here have been demanding a similar ban throughout the EC. But the European Parliament says a ban can't be enforced for at least eight years. This fire brigade video shows all too clearly just how lethal polyurethane foam-filled furniture can be. Very soon after a single match was dropped on this settee, it is a mass of extremely hot flames and the room is filling with choking, acrid black smoke. Anyone can visualize the consequences and occupants of a house where this happens, and yet Europe is refusing to back Britain's lead by outlawing it. That, say firemen, will make the ban difficult to operate in Britain. The regulations as they stand at the moment requires that all furniture that is imported into this country is manufactured to the standards of uh, the UK safety regulations. But however, I've got no doubt in my mind that somewhere during the course of those eight years that it's going to take to introduce the legislation, that some furniture will find its way in. Customs people can't check every stick of furniture that comes in. A Whitby skipper has been committed for trial at Teesside Crown Court, charged with sailing from Whitby to the Arctic Circle after a detention order had been put on his ship. Jack Lammerman had vowed to retrace the voyage of 18th century sailing skipper William Scoresby by sailing to Greenland and back. But the Department of Transport claimed his boat, the Helga Maria, was unseaworthy. Newcastle is on a new list of relocations for thousands of civil service jobs at present cited in London. The government is reviewing 24,000 Whitehall jobs with the intention of moving them away from the southeast. Newcastle has been named as a possible new base along with sites in the Midlands, Scotland, Belfast and Merseyside. A £10,000 reward has been offered in an attempt to catch a sex attacker who stabbed a woman in a city centre car park. 29-year-old Helen Taylor from Craig Mill Park in Blythe was stabbed after she parked a car in the Newgate Street car park in Newcastle on November the 26th. The condition has worsened following major surgery at the Royal Victoria Infirmary. National car parks have now offered the £10,000 reward for the arrest and conviction of her attacker. Well, football now and Sunderland have signed West Bromwich Albion striker Don Goodman for a million pounds. Goodman, seen here playing at Hartlepool last month, cost West Brom only £50,000 when they signed him from Bradford City four and a half years ago. He's been on Wearside today discussing personal terms and undergoing a medical. The fee is more than double Sunderland's previous record, the £450,000 paid for goalkeeper Tony Norman, and it means they've spent nearly all the money they received by selling striker Marco Gabbiadini. And that's the latest news in Tyne Tees. We're back with our first local bulletin at 5 to 10 tomorrow. Hi, good evening. Well, we've had clear skies across much of the northeast so far today. But those clear skies do mean some problems, I think, with the, the temperatures for a while. At the moment, they're getting down towards two or three Celsius in many spots, so a touch of ground frost and mist around as well. But uh, later on in the night, the cloud increasing once again, so temperatures lifting back up just that little bit, tending to clear the ground frost, but still with some mist in a few places. Tomorrow morning, then, we'll get off to a, a cloudy start. A bit, bit, bit of brightness in the west of the region, still some mist around. But that cloud should thin out as we go through the morning. That's going to help clear away the mist. So one or two sunny spells coming, especially in the west. 
tends to remain cloudiest near the east and temperatures back up to about what they should be for this time of year. So at best about 7, maybe 8 Celsius, that's the middle 40s Fahrenheit. And the outlook, quite a settled weather, variable amounts of clouds, so watch out for some frost overnight. This Friday at 10.40, point of order with the people and issues shaping the region's political climate. From Westminster to the north, full coverage of the stories that matter. Point of order with Eric Robson, this Friday at 10.40. Next tonight on Time Tees, it's International Fight Night from Los Angeles. That's after the break. creations come to life with the Technic Control Center. The chances are the television you are now watching is 50 hertz. If you take a close look at the screen, you'll see that it flickers. On a new Philips Matchline 100 hertz television, that doesn't happen. Of course, it has Nikam digital stereo sound, but now the new Philips Matchline with 100 hertz technology offers a visibly clearer picture. Now, let Philips open your eyes. Hobson seldom this excited. New pedigree chum select cuts. Pedigree chum nourishment in juicy, meaty chunks. Now, Hobson has a choice. Imagine there was a way you could get qualifications without having to go back into the classroom. Imagine there were courses written by experts and approved by employers. You could study when it suited you. Imagine a nationwide college that's on your doorstep, wherever you are. Stop imagining. Call the Open College. Phone 0800 300 760 for a free information pack. The Open College. Probably the best work skills training in the world. Hello there. Uh, 11.35 tonight, about 45 minutes from now, we present another story from a master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock. That's tonight, right after International Fight Night at the ringside, Gary Newborn. Angeles becomes more Mexican by the day it's not surprising that the latest boxing hero comes from south of the border 20 year old Manuel Medina is the new IBF featherweight champion the reward of being a professional since the age of 13 good evening from the Great Western Forum in Los Angeles it's incredible that Medina was allowed to turn professional at the age of 13 but you have to understand the Mexican attitude to see how this can happen Medina returns to the Great Western Forum to make the first defense of the world title he won against all odds from the previous champion, Texan Troy Dorsey. It produced a great fight night. Well, the pattern is set. Oh, what a shot. Right hand punch right on the button there. And I think Medina's saying, what was that all about? Where did that one come from? Well, now he knows. Yeah, well, the, the styles suit each other. Uh, Dorsey, obviously, the, the stronger of the two. He enjoys marching forward. Medina quite happy to back off and just pin there the little flicking punch. He's not, we haven't really seen it. There he's on the floor again, Reg. What a, I don't think he can work this out. He didn't expect this, I don't think, Medina. He's a cocky sort of a kid with a lot of backing, but look at that hard face there. He looks as though he's come out of the local central casting, doesn't he? Medina was knocked down twice in the early rounds, but amazingly, he came back to outpoint Dorsey. And didn't the Mexicans love it? Inside the last minute. And really punching themselves to a standstill here. This is, well, almost gladiatorial, isn't it? 
Well, it does share a couple of great fights with Paez, but we have to remember Paez a little bit tight at the weight. He had to conserve energy tonight. He's in with a young boy, full of life, full of energy, and look, he has never stopped. You would think this was the second round instead of the 12th. Uh, look at Medina, still plenty left. Well, when it gets to the 10 seconds, it'll be too late for a knockout because the bell would interrupt if one man went down, and particularly Dorsey. So it's going to points now with two American judges. And what a finish it is. Unbelievable, Jim, really. Well, what a performance by Medina there. And their corner now exactly. In the past year, six world champions have lost their titles here at the Los Angeles Forum. But Medina's backers are convinced he's not going to be the seventh. He won the title here and he's going to retain the title here. Medina's challenger, Tom Johnson, is looking for his sixth consecutive knockout. He's the number one contender for this title, even though he's on medication for an enlarged heart, something he's trying to play down. The Mexicans have been arriving in town in force to see Medina fight. They've even laid on special flights. The visiting fans have been swelling the ranks of Mexicans who already live and work in Los Angeles. Many of them identify with the 20-year-old champion, as one of Muhammad Ali's former cut men, Chuck Bodak, now in Medina's corner, explains. There's a, a second-class second nation, for example, they, the poverty and everything else uh, that exists there, it more or less brings so many, so many kids into boxing because of it, the environment and all, and... Uh, I think per capita, they have more, more fighters, they have more contenders and more champions because of their way of life. We're the only sport that can, we have a gold medals and uh, world champions and uh, I think our people in our country believe in our sport people like boxing. And boxing is number one sport in Mexico. Kids like Manuel, 20 years old, is one of the biggest heroes. So will this continue to be the cemetery of world champions these days? Let's find out now as we join our commentary team of Jim Watt and Reg Gutteridge. And this really is a remarkable world champion, only 20 from Mexico. This is a mandatory defense then, because Sir Tom Johnson is the number one challenger. And here's the parading of the IBF belt for the championship of the world. And Jimmy Lennon is ready to introduce champion and challenger. All right, fans, here we go. This is it, the main event of the evening, the IBF Featherweight Championship of the World, scheduled for 12 rounds of boxing. Introducing to you first the challenger, on my right, fighting out of the red corner. He enters the ring attired in black trunks with burgundy trim and fighting out of Detroit, Michigan. He weighed in at a ready 125 and one half pounds. His fine record, 26 wins, only one defeat, one draw with 18 wins by way of knockout. He is ranked the number one IBF featherweight contender, introducing the challenger, Tom Boom Boom Johnson. his opponent across the ring on my left fighting out of the blue corner is the defending world champion he is wearing black trunks with red and white trim hailing from Tijuana Baja California Mexico he weighed in at 125 and three quarter pounds his fine record 39 wins only three defeats with eight wins by way of knockout that's 18 wins by knockout he is currently the defending IBF featherweight champion of the world, Manuel Mantecas Medina. <laughs> Once again, here's your referee in charge now to give instructions, Lou Moret. And going with the referee there, we have uh, three American judges if it goes 12 rounds. Well, the usual saying, remember to keep them up, gentlemen, there. So, Lou Moret, and there's the, the rundown of statistics. Tom Johnson, well, very tiny, really, five foot five and a half, and uh, having to give away height. But on the other hand, he's a very classy fighter, and adopted, really, by Madison Square Garden. He's been promoted there a lot in New York. No problem with the weight there. Just a quarter of a pound difference. So now, 
Medina looked very impressive, although he was on the deck twice in his last uh, fight with Troy Dorsey, a real Texas yard dog of a fighter. But he overcame that, and he's so slimly built, Jim, and yet he's as tough as old boots and a great deal of ability. Yeah, but uh, this should be a totally different battle from the one he had with Dorsey. Dorsey, very easy to get to, easy to catch with punches. Uh, I thought maybe the, his strength would let him down, but we were quite surprised how strong he actually was. But uh, this will be a different uh, type of opponent altogether. I heard a great deal of, about Tom Johnson, born in Indiana and comes out of Detroit, which very much, as you know, a hotbed of boxing, a, a left hook's a calling card in that town. So I'm looking forward to this challenge, although on the other fellow's doorstep, Los Angeles really in Tuana, it's only really a left hook down the road to these fellas. And such a packed Mexican audience. So the odds are always against Johnson, but uh, nonetheless, he's been well taught and survived a lot of uh, handicaps, although he says the enlarged heart problem is, although he's on constant medication, has never given him any problem. And I think this tribute that he even gets in the ring and he was even partially blinded by a car accident back in 85. He looked so frail, Medina, Jim, and that judging on the Dorsey fight with nothing to be farther from the truth, he really soaks it up and comes back. Yeah, well, we thought against Dorsey, the longer the fight went, that uh, Dorsey would get to him and wear him down. But uh, actually, the opposite happened. He seemed to get stronger as the fight went along. He warmed to his task. But a uh, good sharp start here. Uh, Johnson finding it a little bit difficult to get into range. He, he's flicking with the jab. Boy, no trouble with that one. No, oh, beautiful right hand counter punch then, wasn't it? He just waited for half a lead to come at him and shot the right hand over the top. Doesn't seem that much difference in height there, Jim. I'm wondering if they got the wrong tape measure there. Yeah, well, uh, Medina is uh, stripping down there slightly. Mexicans, of course, have churned out so many good fighters that the fly bantam and featherweight division. Kenty Saldivar, three fights with Welshman Howard Winston. Chuchu Castillo, Ruben Olivares, who have fought for fought, uh, Alan Rutkin. Well, I think that's Monte Custard, so apparently being smooth in Mexican or Spanish. Good opening round, Jim. Yeah, good, good shot boxing. Uh, no one of it has really tried to unload the big shot. It's been good classic boxing. Well, they sorted each other out very early there. There was no uh, searching start. And in replay, Jim, has the right hander coming in from Johnson? Well, good technique. Bang. Right over the left hand lead. Perfect. Second round. The IBF featherweight championship of the world. And the World Boxing Council champion is Britain's Paul Hopkinson. And his manager, Barney Eastwood, is at ringside checking up on this one. Just so maybe you'll want Hopkinson in with the winner. Apparently, Jim, I think quite ridiculous, a pro at 13, Medina, but uh, apparently they say that nobody with boxing was a as an amateur. And it seems a bit ridiculous at that age, isn't it? Schoolboy stuff. Yeah, well, he's certainly developing into a, a decent fighter. He's, he's carrying his chin a little bit high. He's been caught a couple of times at the beginning of the round here. Just his chin a little bit too high. Good, correct boxer too, the challenger, Johnson. He's 27. Johnson's getting a little bit closer now in the second round here. He had trouble getting past the jab in the first, but he's getting a little bit closer now. Well, if it's going to stay as close as this, I hope that the American judges are not going to be swayed by the bias of the crowd. They come from San Diego, Seattle and Chicago. Good start by the challenger. 
Medina did this with uh, Dorsey, you remember, Jim, was down twice in the, from right-handers, as I recall. Yeah, he got caught with silly punches in the first couple of rounds of, of the Dorsey fight, and the same thing's happening here. See, he steps back, yeah, but his chin is unprotected as he goes back. Plenty of skill, isn't it, in a fight like this? Yeah, they're, they're both good sharp movers. Medina is a boxer, but funnily enough, he doesn't think too much about defence. He wants to move around quickly and box at long range, but his defence could be a little bit tighter. Johnson's had a draw with uh, Troy Dorsey for the USBA Championship. That'll give you an idea of his class. and. Uh, He's getting $25,000 for this challenge, which is not great money. Certainly less than a lot of British champions have been getting. And the champion is collecting $75,000. What a difference a title makes, Jim. Yeah, but there uh, doesn't seem a lot of snap in Medina's punches in the first few rounds. I mean, he's, he's catching the challenge with good shots. It doesn't seem a lot of power yet. 